So where are we, Dan? Where are we heading? North of the border. We're on the road again. Uh, we are going <laughs> to the Kinuka Inn. Kinuka Inn. How do you right. say it? People who know and are from it, it's pronounced Kinuka. 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 Yeah. Okay. It's an interesting place because they use almost all of the produce from the estate in which the restaurant is located. So some of the supply line problems won't have hit them. That's good. That makes sense. It's a real farm to fork operation. They're, they're aiming for self-sufficiency and I don't think they're far away from it. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Let's hope the weather holds. Yes. James, hi. Hi. How you doing? Nice, nice to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Hey, James. It's good to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. So what do we got here, James? So this is uh, Bow House, which right. is, uh, we're, we're on the Balkaski estate. And, uh, and then just down the way here is where we have all our, uh, our veg growers, Tom and Connie. And then uh, just literally down the road, we've got um, St. Monans and Pitt and Weem, which is... Uh, that close. Yeah, <laughs> that close, yeah. Where uh, we get all our fish and shellfish. And then in here is uh, the butchery. Okay, so go check it out. Yeah. So I'll, I'll leave the butchery to you guys. Maybe I'll, I'll see you at the veg. I'm vegetarian, of course. <laughs> oh, no. Let's go in. Wow, this is big. So, what have we got here? This was just a bit of forecourt to meat that I've been chopping up. So, getting some stewing cuts out of it, uh, getting some little steak cuts out of it. So, this is quite an underused steak called the petite tender. Um, but it's right. essentially like it's sort of second most tender muscle next to a fillet and, and no one knows about it so it comes out right from the middle of the shoulder normally that sort of just comes off as a big piece and it will just get chopped up and put in trim or whatever but if you just find this little muscle and take it out so I'm trying to get as many steak cuts as I can out of each cow so using all these different cuts which are traditionally just thrown in with like stewing or just into mince and actually just trimming them up to kind of give people more of a, a choice. I don't like to work in a kitchen where you're just buying in like prime cuts, you know, and not, and not just with, uh, with cows, like with sheep as well. It's uh, kind of odd to just buy like r just a solidly just racks of lamb and stuff. It's much more interesting for me and much more interesting for the restaurant. And you're doing sheep and pigs here as well? Yeah, so, uh, so sheep, um, the estate have sort of different breeds, which means they can actually produce lamb all year round because they, they all sort of lamb at slightly different times. Um, and I'm also doing quite a lot of mutton as well, so really? getting the kind of cull ewes that come from the estate. Um, tell, and me, then, tell me what a cull ewe is. So cull ewe is just, <laughs> a, is just a sheep that's not producing any lambs anymore, so it's, it's done its kind of working yeah. life. I think you've also got, like, as a butcher and as like a chef, you do have a responsibility to try and educate people mm. towards that, you know, and we should be in cull ewe mutton, not just because I think it's ethical, but because... It's delicious. It's really delicious. <laughs> So we're here on the estate, yeah. this is where you get all the veg. This is where we get all the veg, which is grown by Connie. And, uh... How long have you been here, Connie? Um, we've been renting land from the estate for three, this is our third growing season. It's a decent size operation you've got. It's two acres, three polytunnels, and it's a no-dig system. So you're getting 90-ish percent of the veg yeah, that we use get, in the kitchen from here? Yeah, we, I mean, we use one other supplier, which is over the way. And all the veg that we'd say was the blockbuster veg that can be the star of the dish all comes from here. What difference does that make when you're getting stuff so quickly from, you know, sort of farm to fork? It's more important that we can get really high quality veg. If we get something that's very high quality, we, uh, we don't want to mess around with it too much. So we won't be adding lots of butter and purees. We like to serve it as it is so you can taste how, how good it is and hopefully uh, cook it with respect. So we're hearing a lot about the supply chain squeeze at the yeah. moment. Does having access to projects like this on your doorstep make you resilient to that? It makes us a, a lot more resilient in, uh, in terms that we don't really have to use like large scale suppliers or as much fruit and veg as some places might use from Europe. Are you uh, one of the lucky ones in that respect though? Not everybody has lucky, access yeah. like this. Um, uh, I think uh, if you're going to have a, uh, a rural restaurant, you should be using sort of rural produce as well that's, that's grown out here because it seems something crazy about having a, uh, a restaurant in, uh, in Fife and then uh, going sort of from London to Edinburgh, you know, via from Milan in that sense to get veg. We work on a thing where like they send me an email on, on like a Monday and then they get the same with Lewis who does the fish and, 
and I know what there is meat wise as well so like I'll see what's in season and then that will govern uh, what the menu is rather than me say this is a menu I need this I'll always be like what do you have that's good right let's have that and then let's decide what we're going to do with it and that, for me that's just a more fun exciting way to cook. Does that hinder your chances of ever getting a Michelin star? I mean, I, I, I don't know. Look, I imagine there's uh, chefs that do work like that, but it's not very... Look, a long time ago, I decided that um, I hadn't a big interest in, in, in awards and stars. What I had an interest in was uh, people sitting down, enjoying food, and that gave me pleasure. This is all local produce, right? Yeah, and, well. and it's an amazing selection of stuff. Oh, that is just a beauty. These are razor clams, right? They call these spoons. Spoons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're a lucky man. Yeah, yeah, I am because we've got like the veg literally like just down the road, and then we've got the meat like Same place, boat house. Yeah. yeah, and then uh, the fish here, and it's that freshness, that quality that hopefully makes its way onto the plate. Were you involved in the design of this place? So there was already a, a couple who were sort of the architects who were sort of coming on board and doing the interiors. And then really when we came on board, it was sort of nine, nine months before the end of the project. Right. And so I then would meet with the architects because there was a sort of whole idea of here, but also I just needed to come in and get a bit more practical, yeah. you know, for example, the bar didn't have that hole coming through. I had to Good fight. Lord. Really? <laughs> really hard to get that because they said, no, it doesn't really work with the whole visual. And I said, but I, it's so necessary. But you've got service flow is everything. And that's yeah, also, exactly. There's two extra members of staff to cover the. Yeah, yeah. so just little yeah. things like that. But, you know, this was, it was really built from the inside out. You've ended up with an easy utilitarianism. Yeah. There's a sort of sparsity, aesthetic. but also... It's yes, austere, but, but, yeah. but comfortable. I wanted people to feel that, you know, they're being welcomed into our, into our home, as it were, you know, sort of with the food and, and the service, and you sort of feeling comfortable from the minute you arrive. What are you doing here, James? Yeah, sorry. So these are the pork pies that uh, we've got on at the moment uh, in the restaurant. So uh, I'm just adding the uh, jelly which is traditional in a pork pie. I can't help but notice that you're injecting this pie. Is that the yeah. traditional no, technique? No, I, I used to use a jug and I've found it's a little bit less messy to use the, the sort of meat injector and also quite apt at the moment that it's getting vaccinated. Right, so is it going to be double jabs or triple jabs? Yeah, it's getting like 20 times jab. They right. will be completely immune from anything by the time it's done. <laughs> Tell me about your, your story, James. How long were you working in London? Was it uh, sort of 18 years working yeah. in London so, kitchens? Uh, so I grew up in a restaurant, which was in uh, Halifax in Yorkshire. And then uh, I moved to London and this woman, Angela Hartnett, was uh, opening at the Connor and they needed chefs to be there. So I took a job there. So after 18 years in London, what led you up to this corner of Scotland? Well, basically, I was asked to look at this place. Uh, I bumped into someone in Shoreditch. She was looking for a chef take over here and she offered for me to come up they'd pay for us to come up and have a look I said yes and we came up but then when we saw the produce and everything else was around here we thought well were you ever a bit concerned it was sort of in a remote part of the country yeah I mean I was concerned it? up to the point when it you know before we opened and when we opened anyone who opens a business and especially somewhere they don't know like an area they don't know they tell you that they're not concerned then I think they should have been This place from the outside is, is it's like a corner pub in a very, very, very small, I suppose village is the word for it. Yeah. How, did, how were you greeted when you arrived? What happened with the locals? I think it was difficult because obviously this was a very old traditional pub, um, which previously everything had been traditional fare as they refer to it. Um, so it was quite tricky to sort of open and people suddenly had been coming here for 20, 30 years mm. to suddenly come in and just think, what is going on here? We opened at the end of uh, September 2019 and then managed to get six months and we were working incredibly hard and we were really, really busy. And then like everyone else, we just fell off a cliff. We then decided to do a sort of voluntary service for the village so that we made food at cost. I think people really appreciated that in the village and we suddenly made 
quite a lot of friends. So what happened then? You, you brought some, some guys up from London to yeah, work in so the kitchen. Yeah, so one of the guys had moved up with his family and everything. And then after sort of three months of the pandemic, he decided to move back down. And then the other chef that was with me, that had been with me from the start, he uh, didn't want to be around anymore. He wanted to be down in Yorkshire, where he was originally from. Staffing hasn't really sorted itself out. It's hard rurally, but I think it's been hard in like big cities like London as well, because I think some people have had this time off with furlough and they've reassessed what they want to do with their lives. It's been more of a struggle to get staff since... Uh, so it is one of the legacies of the pandemic for the restaurant business, do you think, going to be that staff are going to have to be paid a little bit more? Uh, well, I think it's already starting back in the day, like uh, when you started off, you got paid very little and you worked a lot of hours and you're just like, well, that you just accepted it then. But I think these, these days people just don't want to do that and I can see why. Yeah. So you're opening up now back up to full speed. Yeah. Are you yeah. Fi finding staff? Staffing is a problem. You know, we are we're struggling uh, to find, you know, another chef to come on board, particularly where we are. Someone's got to make a sort of a life choice to come and be here mm. if they want to work in the kitchen. It does feel positive, but I think it's about attracting people to come and work for us and, and therefore we have to manage expectations and also look at how we run the business and look at pricing and all of those things. And, you know, pricing needs to perhaps go up and things need to, so to reflect people's wages, people's way of life. It's trying to find that balance. Um, great food, if you don't have great service, it's the two have to, you know, they have to go hand in hand because otherwise it doesn't work. Tim, when James and Althea came up here in 2019, after sort of 18 years working down in London, it was already a bit of a punt. But then a few months later, along came COVID and completely turned their plans upside down. It was definitely a risk, but strangely mitigated. I mean, they were, they were invited up here, they were recruited up here by the Anstruther family who owned the estate up here. And there was a plan, I think, to try and create a, a, a little bubble of, of food appreciation and foodiness. It hasn't been plain sailing, though. They had oh, to God, win no. hearts and minds. The locals didn't necessarily take to them no, straight away. No. Extraordinarily difficult. But what's happened is it's, it's, it's a double-edged st story. I, I think the, the, they were helped to, to, to set up. They got started. COVID hit. Uh, COVID immediately hit them very, very hard but also enabled them to forge relationships with the people around them. Coming out of it, they've been partially insulated, but they've also used that time to, be, to become more flexible in what they've thought about, to think more creatively, and to establish themselves. Something you know, with the, the food brewing here at the moment is the kind of stuff you'd be expected from a place that's been here 20 years. It's, it's, it's confident, it, it's, it's well thought out, and it mirrors the area around. Well, speaking about the squid on your plate, is the same squid that we saw um, freshly caught yesterday. So they're really making the most of this amazing produce that's right on their, their doorstep. They're protected from all these issues around squeeze supply chains that, that we're seeing. And they've got some fantastic produce, which people might travel from far and wide to, to come and see. It's a fascinating all-round story, different from other COVID stories we've seen. But that's been the most remarkable part about going out and visiting businesses during and after, is it's, it's not even just a regional thing. It's not just that Scotland has different COVID rules to the UK. It's far more than that. It's a postcode, literally. You know, another village two kilometres up that way will have a totally different story. There really isn't a difficulty getting people to come here and eat great food. What we're going to have to worry about now is are there enough people to cook it and to serve it? And will people pay enough money to actually cover the increasing costs of even the lovely produce that's here? The price of that is going to go up. Yeah, still so much uncertainty ahead, but as far as I'm concerned, from where I'm sitting, I'm thinking this is worth every penny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. <laughs>